Hey guys, Mark Shields here, Rapanui Life. I just wanted to make a quick video to explain to some of you why we haven't opened the island yet. For those that are perhaps watching this video after the island's already open for tourism, this will be really good for you to know about politics on the island. It gives you a really unique insight into the way people kind of think here on Easter Island. We uh, have been shut down from all tourism for the last two years. People are a little bit hesitant to open up and I'm gonna just explain the mindset of a number of these Rapa Nui people and as to why they are resistant to opening the island. For those that don't know, Easter Island is the uh, place famous for those great giant statues known as Moai, world famous around the world. These statues bring in up to 100,000 tourists a year, at least they did up until two years ago when the whole island closed down for the pandemic. We were gonna open in February just in time for the big Tapati Festival, which is a festival uh, to celebrate all things Rapa Nui Easter Island. Didn't happen. Now the excuse was that they needed to fix the runway up. Now they've had two years to fix the runway up while we've had the pandemic, so it's kind of odd. Most of us believe that the reason they didn't open is uh, something else. I'm going to take you all the way back in history so that you can understand the way the Rapa Nui think about politics, especially as it relates to disease, uh, outside influence and government. So Easter Island is the easternmost corner of the Polynesian Triangle, kind of imaginary triangle that runs from uh, Hawaii in the north, New Zealand in the south, west and here in the southeast uh, it's filled with thousands of islands most of them populated by this polynesian people and they found their way to easter island probably around about 1200 years ago because easter island is so isolated on the eastern corner there's no islands around it was largely untouched for going on about a thousand years but it was in 1722 when a man called jacob rogovan uh, a Dutch explorer found his way to this isolated island. He made his way to shore, had a misunderstanding, opened fire on the islanders uh, with 12 of them dying. Now this was to be the start of a somewhat a difficult interaction with the outside world. In the 1800s, whalers came through and stole uh, woman and male slaves to take away with them. And in the 1860s, Peruvian slave raiders also came to the island, taking with them two thirds of the population at the time to be slaves in Peru. Now, under international pressure, these slaves were sent back about a year later, but they came with smallpox. And this absolutely devastated the island. The island's population dropped from about 4,000 or so in 1860, and by 1877, they had dropped down to just 111 people through immigration, uh, sickness, and the slave raids themselves. So just 111 people really struggling to survive. And in 1888, the Chilean government came across uh, in a naval boat and they said, hey, we will set up a Navy base here and we will look after you. We will make sure that you have a connection to the outside world. So they drew up two quite different contracts, uh, one in Spanish and one in Tahitian. The uh, Rapa Nui people didn't have a written language and they didn't know how to read. They signed this contract with the Chilean government with just a cross. The Tahitian version of the contract, which is what the Rapa Nui could kind of understand, said that the island was going to, to be used by the Chilean people in exchange for protection, whereas the Spanish version said the island was going to be given to the Chileans uh, in exchange for protection. So very different concepts of what was happening then, and to this day this causes a lot of strife with a number of the people on the island. Chile largely doesn't have a strong hold on their own country at the time and they are renting out large tracts of land to European companies which would come in and essentially farm large areas of Chile and employ the people and kind of police it for the Chilean government. This was really just another version of what they were doing in the mainland. They ended up renting the whole island out to a British company by the name of the Williamson and Balfour Company. Now this company set up a huge sheep farm on the island up to 50, 60, 70,000 sheep. There was only a few hundred people at this stage and they pushed them into a small area of the island which is now the town on the island. They put a wall around it and the people could not come and go as they liked. They had to show a specific pass. They essentially became second class citizens having to use a pass to go around the island if they wanted to go out and go fishing or do what they wanted to do. Also during this time leprosy was a big problem. The people were separated according to the lepers and the people who didn't have leprosy 
and a lot of people during this time were sent to the leper colony just because the Chilean Navy would look at their skin and say, you have leprosy, and they would just send them, breaking up family. So it was a very painful time that this disease uh, inflicted upon the people. And it's crucial to understanding the mindset about the disease today, the COVID-19, and the restrictions, of course, about movement if you don't have a pass of mobility. 1953, uh, Chile does not renew the lease for the British company. They leave the island. The Chilean government and the Chilean Navy try to keep the work going, try and keep the sheep running, but largely fail. And the island is really quite poor around this time. And a number of Rapa Nui family actually leave to go and live in Chile. And so they start seeing a different way of life in Chile. And they realize that the Chilean people have a lot more rights than the people in the island and so in 1966 there is this movement or a protest so that the people can have the same civil rights as the people in Chile up to this time they didn't have passports they didn't have voting rights they didn't have anything and so they marched and protested and won the right to have civil rights on the island in 1966 they get their civil rights and there is a law passed it's called Le Pasqua or the Easter Island law which essentially secures the land for the Rapa Nui people so no one can actually buy land on Easter Island if you're not Rapa Nui, which is very good. The other law that's passed is for the same offense in Chile, if you're a Rapa Nui who does the same offense here, you only get one third of the punishment that you would get in Chile. And this is the start of this slightly lawless society where people just aren't getting prosecuted for the things they do, at least not in the way that they should be. Through the 70s and 80s, things get a little better. There's a little more investment from Chile, but the island is very, very poor. There's not much in the way of tourism. Now, this all changes in 1993 with the arrival of the movie Rapa Nui. It was produced by Kevin Costner. It cost $23 million to produce, and it was all produced on the island. And so that $23 million was invested here in Rapa Nui and really lifted a lot of people out of poverty because they employed a lot of the Rapa Nui people. They stayed in the houses of the Rapa Nui people. Fortunately, that happened just at the time as tourism's kicking off. So many people were investing in vehicles, investing in guest houses. People were able to move out of poverty into this kind of middle class, even into somewhat wealth. But there's a change in the society that's happening. People are now moving from Chile en masse over to Easter Island because this is where you can make some money, you can live in relative paradise, and it attracts kind of the working class people of Chile over here. That also brings with it a lot of intermarriage with the Chilean people. A lot of the Rapa Nui who went over in the 50s, 60s, 70s now move back in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, bringing with them the Rapa Nui complexion but quite a Chilean culture. Tourism kind of starts dividing up the peoples. You have uh, the Rapa Nui people who were raised in Chile with the Chilean mindset really pushing into tourism. You've got a lot of Chileans trying to get into tourism. And the Rapa Nui are somewhat involved, but the more original Rapa Nui are uh, still working the land. They're still fishermen, still speaking the original Rapa Nui language. They're much more traditional in their approach, perhaps slightly less educated in most cases. The mixed race people are sending their children over to Chile to study. Uh, They're pushing their children more into the business side of things. And so you have this kind of breakaway between the two cultures. Within this, of course, you've got other subcultures, a lot of foreigners from France and Europe are marrying into the island, raising their children's quite a European style for the more traditional people feeling disenfranchised. So in 1960, 70, 100% of the island spoke Rapa Nui. But during sort of this uh, influx of tourism, pop culture, uh, television and schooling, you have a move away from the original language to Spanish. And so now you have sort of these older people and they're speaking to their kids and grandchildren in Rapa Nui, but their children are now responding back to them in Spanish. Within a generation, you've got grandparents that are now having to speak in Spanish to their grandchildren for them to actually understand them. So going back to 1966, when the people won civil rights, there was a lot of handshake deals with the Chilean government to give land to the government buildings in the center of town. Now at that time, land wasn't worth anything. Everyone had land, and so it was all good. But it was a handshake deal which was supposed to last uh, 40 years, and that 40 years is up in 2007. 
And so in 2010, many of these Rapa Nui, having not received their land back, actually went and protested and took hold of these government properties in a pacific manner, uh, just sitting in and demanding that their land was given back to them. The Chilean government came in heavy-handed, uh, rubber bullets were used, people were thrown out, and the whole community, even though they weren't all originally involved in it, the whole community turned against the Chilean government. Many of the people actually won the rights to those lands. Further protests uh, against one of the main uh, wealthiest hotels on the island, as I mentioned, no one is supposed to own land, only Rapa Nui, but a certain Chilean family was able to buy land somehow, and essentially they were supposed to give that land back, they didn't, and so the Rapa Nui people went and protested that hotel as well, and won the rights to that hotel, paying them at least some rent from using that land. In 2015, a number of the Rapa Nui people took hold of the National Park. Now, the National Park was in Chilean control. They were charging $60 each person to enter. They were making about $6 million a year, and the island was not really seeing any of this money. A lot of these people went and took hold of the National Park and demanded that the Rapa Nui people be in charge of the National Park. They also won that protest. The National Park is now in the control of the Rapa Nui people. Also in about 2012 or 13, the Rapa Nui people were protesting against the unmitigated migration of Chileans to the island. They felt it was getting completely out of control and so they wanted to put in place laws that would restrict uh, Chileans from coming over and just setting up shop. And they actually took hold of the airport for a period of time closing down the arrival of tourists and they also won the right to control the internal migration from Chile to the island. So this is all super important as we move into the pandemic. We have this culture where the Rapa Nui people don't trust the government. They have history with diseases. They have history with diseases wiping out huge parts of the population. They have history of being restricted in their movement on the island. You have this idea that leprosy was actually helped by these supposed vaccines that they took in the 50s and 60s, but also with the idea that protests work. Like if you protest and you do it long enough, as strong enough, the Chilean government will capitulate. And so we all know there's a portion of the population that doesn't want the island open. We also know that this portion of the population is, is more extreme than the rest. The rest of the population wants it open. There's been a vote and they voted in favor of opening it, but the small part of the population, they're extreme and they are willing to go and take that airport. Not only that, they know from past experience if they do it, they will win the protest. The Chilean government feels impotent because they can't send in police to do much about it because a lot of these extreme people are actually women. And so if you go in there and be heavy handed with those women, you're going to turn the favor of the island in general against you. Not only that, you're going to lose credibility on the international stage. So what's got to happen? In my opinion, what's got to happen is they've got to somehow allow the disease into the island, at least the Omricon variant, which is a uh, very uh, low risk of death, then once it's here, the people will say, well, it's here anyway, let's open. The other option is they re pull back on paying people to survive. At the moment, the municipality is employing a huge part of the population with a very minimum wage, but just enough to eat, just enough to eat. And so if they were to pull back that help, the desperation of the people who want to open will go up dramatically and they essentially will go and police the island. There's no consistent backup of the law. It really comes down to who is the most desperate. Is it the people who don't want to open the island or is it the people that do want to open the island? It doesn't matter that the people that do want to open the island are more and the people that don't want to are less. It's who is willing to go to the extreme because the Chilean government will not enforce the law and they're waiting for us to sort it out on our own. So in answer to those who are saying, when are you going to open the island? How long is a piece of string? <laughs> I hope it kind of gives you an insight into the mentality of the island. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to the channel, like and comment if you can. Any questions, make sure you ask me and I'll do my best to answer them. God bless you, take care and we'll see you soon.